Thank you very much. Um, so before we get started, why don't we start with introductions uh, and just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How are you connected to uh, Murchison and um, what invited you or what prompted you to join this meeting? And I am gonna start calling names from the order that I see you guys on my screen. So first up is Michelle Lindo. Hi, Michelle, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Lindo, I'm the newest employee here at Economic and Community Development as the Neighborhood Engagement Manager. Um, I have a history in law enforcement, having been a police officer with NYPD uh, for eight years before relocating here to North Carolina. Um, I also worked with the Fayetteville Police Department for 15 of my 21 years here in the city and in the capacity as a crime prevention specialist where um, the corridor, Murkison Road, was where I concentrated most of my efforts. Uh, I have ties to that area with family as well, as my family is a, was born and raised here. And I'm here now to learn and glean and I'll hopefully offer some information to everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next up is M. Worrell. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Worrell, and uh, I am a, a business owner on Murchison Road. I own Heron Funeral Care and Cremations, and I also have family members who live off of Murchison Road. So I was invited to uh, join this group, uh, and I'm just willing to add my insights, my experience, and uh, go from there. Thank you for having us. Great having all of you guys. Next, Chastity. Hello, my name is Chastity. I am um, a community educator with Ameri Health, and I travel Murchison Road pretty much daily to get to and from my different events that I have to go to. And I stumbled across this online. I was looking for something else, and I saw this um, taking place. And so I signed up so that I can give my insight on a few things that I've noticed. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us. Madame Dominique Lazo Johnson. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dominique. Um, so I work for the city of Fayetteville. I am working with Andrea and Adam, um, assisting them with this project, uh, the Mergers and Choice Initiative. Um, so uh, I, I'm not too familiar with uh, Murchison Road. I was stationed here back in 2012, um, and then I left, and then I came back, um, and I have been able to see the area change a lot, um, and I really am excited to be a part of the continual change. So that's me. Thank you, Dominique. Next, uh, we have KM Services. And it's okay if you're multitasking, you're driving on your way to, to work, or you're joining us from your phone, you're in another meeting and you cannot open your microphone. That's all right. Um, participation in this meeting is voluntary. Um, we also have features at the bottom of your screen. You feel free to use the chat uh, as well as reactions. If you strongly agree with someone, we have a reaction for a clap. We have thumbs up. Uh, we have a cry face uh, in case you guys are disagreeing with anything as well. Um, next is going to be Neri, Neri Fikes, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your names. Yes, Najeri. Good morning. I am the Federal Police Department's Community Engagement Coordinator, um, and I found out about this through Dominique, actually. Great having you, Najeri. Uh, next up, we have our Community Ambassador, Jeanette. Good morning, everyone. My name is Johnette Henderson. I am, as she said, one of the community ambassadors working with the initiative. I am originally from Fayetteville, North Carolina. I grew up in the 1600 block of Murchison Road. I still own property there. And I'm just excited about the possibilities and interested in some of the feedback today. Thanks for joining us. Last but not least, Patrick McArdle. 
Hi, my name is Patrick McCardle. I'm a battalion chief with the fire department in Fayetteville. Um, I'm actually housed at the fire station 14 right on Langdon Street, kind of in the heart of the Murchison Road corridor area. My responsibility is that area and the whole north side of the city. Um, and I'm here to help answer anything that the fire department can assist with um, with this project. Great to have you. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Oh wait, um, there's actually a public service announcement right now for anyone that is a business owner or has been uh, interested in uh, opportunities for starting a business next Monday. Um, there is going to be the Virtual Business Expo. It's a virtual event um, put together by the city of Fayetteville uh, and uh, some folks as well related to this plan. Um, so there's going to be a resource fair. There's going to be um, education and there's going to be like opportunities that would help you or would possibly help uh, your folks if you are trying to start your business or if you are looking for opportunities to grow your existing business. Uh, I would encourage all of you guys to attend this virtual business expo next Monday at 10 a.m. Um, at the end of this meeting, I will be putting the link on the chat or feel, feel free to uh, message me privately as well. My, I am putting my email on the chat as well. One moment. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to walk you guys over um, the findings and the outcomes of our past working group meeting. So today is the fourth working group meeting of the second set of meetings. We are having three sets of meetings, one per month for the, we started in January and the last one is going to be in March. Uh, we have meetings dedicated to different topics that are related and are interested in informing our um, choice neighborhood plan, right? So we started with a day dedicated to equity and inclusion. We started, um, then we had a meeting about housing and commercial development. Yesterday was dedicated to education and job training. And today we are the safety, security and health. So the greatest takeaways from the first meeting was that the community and this working group was interested in community policing, in community organizing. Um, they want to find ways to keep the community clean and they want to expand or they want more comprehensive health programs. Um, regarding the community poli policing issue, they want to tap into existing block watch programs. Um, the health, there, is, uh, there was a comment about the health department receiving funding related to health equity. Um, they want to assess the internal training and practices from the community police. They want to focus on problem properties and give them immediate assistance. Um, specifically, there is a, a house across MTH. Uh, I assume that's Methodist. Um, and they want to send they want to assess some bus stops. We actually are gonna have some news to share about uh, bus stops and interventions on bus stops coming up, coming soon, actually. They want social agencies to be part of this community health and safety plan. And they want um, to follow and track health metrics in this community. Um, there's a coordinated health ne network here in North Carolina and um, these were just the initial concerns, um, just uh, identifying uh, potential issues, potential resources that we could um, further develop or build upon. Then we have this worksheet where we talked about what's working and what is not working. So from what is working is that, um, according to the group that was in this meeting the last time, is that community health and safety is actually not as bad as people say it is. Um, there was a comment saying that long-term residents generally feel comfortable living uh, here. Um, the police officers have a good neighbor program and they would like to uh, build more interest in this program. Additionally, uh, the neighborhood watch program has it is listed under the things that currently work. Um, they are waiting for a new uh, police department representative to engage in the community. 
um, the response times are actually not a problem when um, they have had emergencies, and that's a good thing. Um, the program for free smoke detector and installations and changing batteries has been successful. Uh, police coming to merchants and townhouses has actually made a difference. The police department has hired crime prevention spe specialists and are currently in training. That's, that's a good thing. And the fire prevention programs have also been successful. Um, the business block watch is being established uh, and uh, there are current ongoing meetings to establish it. Um, there is a tracker. Oh, there is a website specific for the city of Fayetteville where you can find where to sign up for these programs. And uh, the Police Athletic League has, helping has helped build long-term relationships with the community at EE Smith Rec Center. So these are good things. These are assets that we can definitely build upon. And then uh, things that are not working are people hearing gunshots, even during celebrations. Of course, that's upsetting. Um, feeling the lack of attention from the police department. Uh, there are feelings or there's an impression that Murchison Road is not a safe place to be. But actually, this leads to a question. Is this actually actual data or is more of a reputation? And uh, there is also an opposition with newcomers don't feel as comfortable compared to long term residents. Um, other things that are not working is people constantly are reporting gunshots. Uh, the crime seems to be going, going down. However, violent crimes are going up, according to this comment. There are um, there's a threat of reproduction of crime if it's reported. Um, so maybe maybe we are hearing about, um, I don't know, retaliation if anyone reports a crime. Um, there's lack of po police patrol inside communities. There's drug activity. Um, police aren't around as much at night and people have experienced personal property damages. Um, anyone has additional comments that should be on this board right now? Things that are working or things that are not working? or the people generally agree. I want to invite everyone to open your microphones and feel free to uh, let us know your thoughts about this. Maybe if I zoom in, you can see better. I know that with um, the Murchison townhouses, there was a home that was being um, specifically complained about that was on Waddell Street. Um, I believe that was one of the um, stickies that you referred to earlier. And um, there was reports of like crime activity going on there by one of the residents. Um, we let the property owners know in Fay PD. And I believe that um, the last time I heard the crime there has pretty much ceased. So that's a good thing. That definitely is an accomplishment. That's that's really great to know. Thanks for that, Dominic, because it, it actually tells us that when people report things and people actually speak up, um, it leads to changes. So thank you for that. Um, anyone else? Um, I can speak historically about um, crime issues in the corridor after having been a crime prevention specialist there for about 15 years. Um, one of the issues that I faced with the citizens was getting them to actually call the police to report uh, suspicious activity and things that may have been going on that looked like it could lead to a crime. Um, oftentimes there is a misunderstanding about crime. Um, what's usually high in the corridor is well, property crimes for one thing, but also violent crimes as well. Um, it has to be a uh, partnership with the police and the community because, you know, police can't be everywhere at every time. And, and also I've been a police officer, so I know this, um, really takes the involvement of the citizens to participate. And that participation would include watching out for their neighbors, um, securing their own property, uh, that they don't want to be taken and calling 911. I mean, I know it's it's um, challenging nowadays, but um, I will say this, after having worked at Fellow PD and also with NYPD, 
um, and also been a, <laughs> a guard in the prison system as well. Retaliation is not really something that happens on a small scale with regard to maybe reporting breaking and enterings and things like that. Retaliation is something that usually occurs when we're talking about um, serious crime, um, big crimes, or you know, drug dealers and things of that nature. Um, they have targets on each other's backs, but um, you can call anonymously. That is something that has to be understood. Uh, when you place a call to 911, you can call anonymously and your information is ex extracted from the public information record. So there could be no retaliation if that is how you are uh, um, placing that call. And it's very important that the citizens understand that when they do place the call to 911, that they say that they do want to remain um, anonymous. I do know that um, even though there may be a shortage of crime prevention specialists, there is still a specialist available to come out and speak about any needs and or have conversations on the phone call. Um, I used to actually train over there, train the new specialists, so I'm fully aware. Uh, if they're not available, there is also a supervisor. Uh, the police are available. I do believe that Chief Hawkins has an open door policy where people can actually call and have conversations of things that are lacking. Um, please don't ever feel like you're being ignored. Um, you, everybody knows the nation as a whole is having a challenge right now employing police officers. It's a difficult job. People have no idea how difficult it is. And as a result of today's climate, it is even more difficult. So I would encourage everybody, um, you know, the ambassadors to get the word out uh, to the neighbors as well that um, it is definitely a partnership to keep neighborhoods safe. We really have to look out for each other. We really have to get to know who our neighbors are uh, and get back to those days of just being community. Thank you very much for that encourage, encouragement, Michelle. Um, yes, I, I am very happy to have you on board and uh, to hear your feedback as well. Um, Anyone else before I move to the next part? Yes, Andrea. Hi, how are you, Jeanette? Good morning. Uh, good morning. So I have Cynthia on my cell phone. She has a issue with her uh, internet that was a wreck in front of her house. And she's one of the uh, uh, ambassadors that's working with the initiative. And she actually had a question for Michelle. And I'm gonna see if I can't um, say it back to you. So Cynthia, tell me one more time. Maybe they can hear you, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I understand, um, you know, we've heard that year after year after year that they're, they can't employ enough police officers or they don't have enough uh, um, crime prevention specialists for quite some time. And um, I'm just curious to find out uh, with the ratio of people, um, and you can just break it down for this community um, or uh, or favor, whatever statistics you may have, uh, how many officers do we need? Um, how is it that, you know, we don't, as citizens, uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, well, I don't know. I have not looked up those statistics. I, I say it like that. But um, we've heard time and time and time again that there aren't enough officers. So I'm just curious to find out how many do you need and, um, you know, why doesn't the city increase the incentives for officers to join? Did you hear that? I, I heard, thank you. Okay. Um, I cannot speak to the statistics as to the number of officers that are necessary um, for the city. Um, I will say this, again, I'm speaking historically, if they are short staffed on police officers, it doesn't mean that they start the shift short. OK, so that would mean the officers are working overtime to basically fill the need in the community. Right. With regard to crime prevention specialists, it's the same thing. Um, when we were short crime prevention specialists, everybody doubled down and took on the duties that were required to get the information out to the public. So that's not an issue. Um, I would say that and the question regarding the number that are necessary is something that needs to come from command staff at the police department. And the city has in fact offered initiatives um, to draw more police. I know that they're paying 
part-time offices a pretty large penny to come and fill in, as well as offering uh, sign-on sign -on bonuses as well. So that is something that they are actively and you know trying to change. But again, it's not just unique to Fayetteville. That is something that's going on nationwide. Um, I come from NYPD, so I keep up with a lot of people up there. Um, and you can just see in the news, it's it's everywhere. It's something that's it's challenging right now. And of course, you know that things come and go and they come and go and they come and go. And as the climate changes, hopefully this will change as well. Several years. Wait a minute. I get that. Cynthia, I, again. I understand that. But my concern is only for the community and, and, for, and right now for the community that we live in. And this is the, that's the main thing that we hear from uh, citizens in this corridor. You know, where's the police? Why aren't they here? Uh, you know, what's going on? Why is this continuing to happen? Um, you know, I don't know if you, you know, I, I, I'm not sure who I'm talking to, but, um, you know, if you drive down uh, um, um, Jasper Street, you know, people are always, uh, you know, in that area. There mm -hmm. must be some part of that street that belongs to the city of Fayetteville that they can do something about that corner. And the first thing that when citizens voice their opinion about it, especially to us as ambassadors, that's the first thing they talk about. Then, you know, uh, the police department or those who uh, are in, you know, in, you know, can answer that question, it always comes out that there aren't enough officers. So um, are they doing overtime over here? Or, you know, I, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm not asking you to per se to answer the, that question, but um, I'm just throwing it out there that these are some of the questions that citizens need to be to know. Um, you know, um, maybe we do need to know how many police officers we need in our community. I, I don't know. And, I, you know, I, I'm just throwing this out there. But um, and then there there's there are a lot of crimes that are, you know, committed on Murchison Road in the corridor that people don't know anything about. Um, you know, uh, I've stated earlier, maybe in another session, I'm not sure, but if you walk around and knock on doors in this community or across the street on Murchison Road, Eccles Park, Seabrook Hills, uh, 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 College Heights, uh, you know, people don't take the paper. That is uh, an unnecessary expense for them. So they don't take the newspaper, so they're not reading it in the newspaper. Um, you know, somehow, um, you know, they don't know, a lot of people don't know what's going on until they speak to one another. Oh, did you know that uh, uh, the... Uh, the, the, the new Dollar General was burned down by homeless people. Um, that's the rumor out here uh, when it burned down. Um, that's a crime. Did you know that the young lady that was opening up the family dollar um, on Murchison Road, and I'm talking down, down on the, the end uh, closest to uh, Fayetteville State, did you know that the, the young woman who was opening up the store this morning was hit in the head? The store was, has been robbed several times. People don't know that. They don't know what's going on in the corridor. So those are the things and, and people, and that is, you know, causes businesses not to want to do business on Murchison Road. So, um, uh, you know, these are just some things that, uh, you know, people have actually called me and I didn't know. Did you know the subway was, was closed down up there that used to be at Walmart? And the reason... I heard was because they, they, they were tired of getting robbed. Um, so, you know, the community doesn't hear about these things. Um, why are all these robberies occurring? Well, the police department says they don't have enough officers. Hmm. That's my comment. I want to, I want to address the fact there, the fact that there are not enough officers is very different than not having officers on the road. Again, when they start the shift, they are required to have a certain amount of police officers in order to begin a shift. So that is always satisfied. 
be that overtime from within the FAVL PD or the $35 an hour, thank you, Dominique, for putting that in the, in the site, on the, in the chat, or already people who are sworn officers in other agencies that would be working uh, part-time as well. So because we don't have a lot of officers does not mean the officers are not on the road. So they are there. Um, I know that the, the area is split up by lots of different sectors and in those sectors, it encompasses lots of neighborhoods. So in order to have an officer in your neighborhood, it's very necessary to call 911. And I'm not making excuses for them. It is how they do what they do. But I do suggest, and I would like to request that Ms. Fikes invite um, maybe the district commander for Campbellton to come on to this uh, working group or his representative so that we can have statistics and information like that uh, to disseminate with the group. With regard to the crime statistics, that's public information. If you don't get the newspaper, um, I know for sure crime prevention specialists pull calls for service and they can clearly give you that information. Um, a lot of the information is posted on the Fable PD's website. And of course the community watch meetings, they have copies of that as well, which will tell you. Um, oftentimes people give part of the story. Um, so the calls for service is really important because someone may call and perceive a crime has occurred, but when the officers get out there, they may code it as um, unfounded or non-criminal you know, non activity. So it's important to get the accurate information and not necessarily hear it um, you know, like a telephone. But I, I do think that Ms. Spikes, if possible, if you can request uh, the district commander to come and join this meeting uh, and or his representative so that those questions can be answered accurately. And what office is Ms. Fikes from again? I believe she's- I'm the actual community engagement coordinator here at the police department. And um, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Fikes. Thanks, Ms. Noel. And thanks, Cynthia, for joining the call uh, over the phone. And thanks for bringing all these issues up to our attention. I think that the, the purpose that we are all here is to actually start finding solutions to these issues that you're bringing up. And as a matter of fact, in the past meeting, we did a little brainstorming uh, exercise where we, where we started identifying strategies to get over these hurdles, right? So uh, for the next step of this meeting, we're going to review the strategies then I'm going to send you guys a poll where we're going to choose the uh, strategies that we want to focus on okay um, before we move along anyone else has uh, comments about this issue or anything else that you want to bring to our attention yes uh, this well this is Mike Worrell um, regarding the issue with the police officers and things of that nature the conversation we had last month where we have the sheriff department annex in the community, but the sheriff department doesn't actually engage in the community because it's a city uh, property. Can someone speak to why don't we look to put more or have a joint uh, uh, sheriff and city annex in that area so that they both can engage in the area so that that can help in that presence that sounds like the community is asking for. Thanks for your question, Mr. Worrell. Yes, I see Michelle uh, raised her hand, unmuted herself if she was going to answer. Yeah, so again, I'm only speaking from my time when I was with FPD, and that's something that was explored in the past, um, joining the family PD as well as the sheriff's office together into a large department. But for whatever reason, again, I'm not, on, I'm not, that's way over my pay grade to speak to what happened with that. But I do know that the sheriff's annex is there mostly because of the school resources officers. It was an office, not necessarily for patrol. And those officers at that annex, again, therefore, the, the school resources, from time to time, citizens may come in and ask questions. Um, but we have to remember that a lot of the 
job description for the sheriff's deputies um, is to handle civil processes. Um, they don't routinely patrol neighborhoods like police patrol. They're out and about, but they're not patrolling like the police do. Um, they do answer calls for service as well. And they have the entire county, not just the city of Fayetteville. So the entire Cumberland County. So you probably wouldn't see, I've been living here 28 years. I only see a deputy when something happens in my area. And that may be five times since I've been here on the street that I reside because they just, they do have a different function and they have a larger area to patrol. But again, that is definitely something that um, we could probably invite someone from the sheriff's department to come over as well and speak to that or even the representative, the Campbellton district commander would be able to speak to that as well. Okay, well, can I add a follow up regarding that? And I understand what you, what you just uh, explained. I guess as this community interactions, we are looking for solutions. My, I guess my follow up question to that is, who do we talk to about getting that joint community? Because there's a lot of vacant land down there. There's a lot of, sad to say, cheap land in the Mercer World Corridor where city uh, offices, city government can come in and purchase that and become a presence in that area. And lack of a better term, taking that high dollar, high tax. Okay, let me just step back a minute. We as taxpayers, we pay taxes for the, the city buildings that are downtown. Those are, and that's high taxed areas. I would like to see about how about taking these government buildings and these high tax dollars and moving them into the corridor, which occupies, you know, like a lower tax base, but then at the same time bring jobs and a lack of a better term, nicer environment in these communities and with the uh, and, uh, with the sheriff's department and the police department, who do we talk to about making that happen? So those are the solutions we're trying to get to because we can talk about them as long as we're talking about them amongst ourselves, I need to know who do we present those proposals to, to try to make that happen. Because if it was on the table before, I'd really like to know why it didn't work because right now the problem still exists. I would, I would suggest, and, and, and this isn't just for this particular issue, but with any, any issue that, that is similarly designed, um, the essential purpose of politics is the allocation of funds. Anything that happens on that type of level would be, that would involve separate government entities would start with your elected officials, because they are the ones who allocate the funds ultimately. Anything that we decide to do on a large scale in this department, in the school district, in, in county government, they all come from money that is allocated from elected officials. So I would suggest finding out your specific council person who represents you on the county commissioners, looking at those um, elected officials where there are budget requisitions for specific things and line items for things of that sort, making sure that those same things are in public comments at um, a council meeting even. Those are the types of things that will push your initiative further because coming from here, any solution that we come up with would still have to be allocated. They would still have to have money behind it, requisition for, for that. And so that would be your start. I think that in this capacity, our role is to say, mm -hmm. these, are, these are some things that occur or don't occur and maybe why or why not they occur. Even like regarding um, just basic officers, it would, even be really helpful also if we could encourage people from communities to go into law enforcement 
as a recruiting tool, um, I was actually talking to someone at Federal State yesterday in the criminal justice department. And a lot of the things that we would love to see come back to personal feelings. They're not things that can be legislated. They are people's personal beliefs about things. If we deploy 80 extra, this is just a figure I made up randomly, 80 extra officers on the streets, 40% would be super excited and 60% would say, why are we being over police? So these are the conversations that are very, very real and they're difficult to fix. The people that are here on this call are people that are invested. And so the approach is completely different. My grandparents' neighborhood where I'm originally from is very similar to this area. And I actually just looked at what their home and land, which now it's, of course I inherited it, but I look at what it's worth now versus what it was worth when I was, I think maybe like 15. And it is worth, maybe 30% of what it was worth 40, you know, 35 or 40 years ago because of the, the same types of things, because of crime, because of absentee land loaners. So none of this is anything that is specific to just here, but it's a huge, huge issue. And there are places that have adopted all of these different things that they've seen work in, in other places, mm -hmm. going after absentee landlords who allow the neighborhoods to look bad. But a lot of what has to happen for safety and security re really requires getting people who aren't going to attend things to also see the need to be present and to be at the table. Because all of us are dedicated for whatever reason or another, but it's really going to be moved by the people that are hanging out on Jasper Street, the people that see them they're gonna be what's gonna make the shift happen. It's because anything else is gonna be seen as big footing. So the, the question we also need to look at is how do we engage with people who also have a direct relationship or communication with the people that we think are part of the problem. And if we can tap into that, then we can see some systemic change and it's not gonna be overnight but it will give us all some tools and it will give people some ownership because we have to get community ownership in order for anything to happen of any, of any substance. Okay. Um, and I don't want to dominate the, the forum here, but two more things um, I'd like to add. Um, one of the participants talked about the uh, lack of uh, communication in terms of uh, the, the, like the, the people in the community don't get the favorable paper. Is there a way that the police blotter can be uh, given to the favorable press? Because I know that is distributed kind of freely to the area. And maybe we need to get a hold of the favorable press to say, will they be willing to, you know, like, uh, report out uh, community issues, things of that nature, uh, versus just advertisement, because I know I pay just to be advertised in it, but it was just a contribution for us. But at the same time, there needs to be a little bit more substance in the community press, and maybe that is something we can look to do to help spread that knowledge of what's going on in the community. That's really, that. that that's great. And I, I in a former life, I, I sold advertising for um, small, small market, family owned radio station. And <laughs> giving up column inches is akin to us giving up free airways. If you can convince them, I mean, so nothing is secret. Things are a matter, you know, things that are a matter of public record calls for service that the crime prevention specialists have. If you can convince them to give up column inches for that, that would be fantastic. But in that regard, the onus would be on them to, to give it up. And also, um, and I know people listen to the radio, WIDU on um, every third Tuesday, the Fayetteville Police Department is on there. And I don't know how many people are tuning in. I don't know what their Arbitron ratings look like, but if they have social media, which is free, there's typically not a slew of people that are necessarily tuning in, which isn't, which isn't really great. 
but there are some free avenues out there for information to be out there. Again, it all goes back to people wanting to know. And the challenge for everyone here is how do we convince people why this is important? Because if people don't feel that it's important, if they don't necessarily buy in, we'll have work groups as my granddad would say, until Jesus comes in, you know, we'll, we'll still be there. So that's, that's all of our, that's our challenge is how to get people to be invested in engaging with these different organizations that are, that are present. But if you can convince them to give us some free uh, column mentions, we, we can make some things happen. Love all the comments that have been made. This is Johnette and Cynthia. Um, basically, uh, Cynthia and I serve on the Neighborhood Watch for the Seabrook Broadhill community. And one of our um, strategies for this upcoming year is to actually get a newsletter together that we can send not only electronically, but um, hard copy to a lot of the folks that live in the community that are part of the community watch. That can be an avenue in terms of using you know, print material to make people aware of some of the crime issues that are going on, some of the hot pockets, I guess, or hot spots. Um, but I do like the, the idea about, um, you know, integrating the, the, the uh, sheriff's department as well as the police department. And again, just as Ms. Fike said, people won't have to want to be involved and have to want to make a change. I think the whole opportunity um, exists in terms of the neighborhood initiative to possibly use this as, um, you know, the, 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 the epitome of getting it together. How do we want to, maybe we can insert this into the proposal that we're going to send to HUD um, to get these things going and moving. Um, maybe we can pay the free press, you know, for a spot to have um, information about um, crime pockets in the, in the community, because you want to know what's going on around you. I go out on the website, but we have a lot of elderly. They're not going to do that. That's not their strong suit because they just don't like the internet or they don't like social media and things of that nature. So just trying to appeal to all the different um, types of uh, residents that we have in the area to make sure that everyone's duly informed. Those that want to know, and sometimes those who don't want to know, they just might have to stand to come about the information. So um, great job, guys. I like this conversation. Well, let me ask a quick question. If, if money, if money is an object, not like millions of money, millions of dollars rather, but if we are looking at something that would help seniors in terms of like new technology, things like ring cameras, things that they're not typically going to um, avail themselves of just because there's a, a, you know, a decent learning curve. What are some things that you think would be beneficial? What types of programs would help them feel comfortable maybe adopting technology with ring cameras? Would it be if there were like a, a cross-generational group maybe working with them to say, this is how you do this, this is how you look at it. Um, you know, we all buy our parents or grandparents, you know, those of us that are, that are middle-aged, we buy our parents things and they look at the tech and they're like, oh, well, I saw it on TV, but then they get the tech and the tech is just, is just sitting there, you know? So what, what are some things that you think could bridge that information gap for safety for, you know, our, our seniors? I have a suggestion on that. Here you go. Cynthia's talking. And, uh, go ahead. Can you, can they hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, um, that's a great idea. Um, uh, I had thoughts, you know, over the se over several years that there there are a lot of elderly people. I would say, you know, in in the community, and you are absolutely right. They don't, you know, they're not interested in the techie uh, things. But I tell you what, what happens each week for me from church every Sunday after church, I receive, uh, you know, it may come late at night. It, it goes to straight to voicemail or. I pick up the phone and they tell me what's going on in church that week. So um, I, I don't know the cost for that. It, you know, um, but that um, I think uh, if I could interject that suggestion um, to um, the young lady that was speaking early, earlier uh, so eloquently about uh, where, you know, comparing her neighborhood 
uh, where her grandparents grew up and where she is now, um, you know, uh, it, I call it robocalling. They do that when they want your vote. Uh, why can't something be done, uh, you know, to identify these homes um, where the elderly live? And they all have landlines. Most of them do. They don't even have cell phones, uh, smartphones. So, um, you know, uh, a robocall each week or every other week to, um, you know, just how's your day? This is what's going on. Uh, in your community, you know, directly from the police department and the sheriff's department to combined. Um, and I also like the, I love the comment about uh, what the gentleman said about the sheriff's department right here on Jasper Street. That is obviously, uh, I believe it still belongs to the county that building does, uh, Cumberland County Schools. It used to be Fuller School, if, though, if anyone on the on the call remembers Fuller School. And, um, you know, I, I have a, a blatant question. Why are they there? The people that hang out on Jasper Street don't give a flying fig about that uh, sheriff's department because they know that there's nothing that the sheriff can do as far as anything. I, you know, only thing I see the sheriff's department doing there is at the crosswalk you know, crossing the kids walking from E.E. E. Smith when school is out. Um, you know, it's it's a, a, a center. Um, you know, I've been in there. I've introduced myself, and, and they, uh, they house uh, fans for the elderly. They do, you know, their community service projects out of that building, but there's no law enforcement coming from that building, and that's what kind of presence we need there and so i commend the gentleman that mentioned that um you know maybe combining forces there to help and i get it uh we have to go through our elected officials which it would be nice if we had one or two um and i'm, I'm not there I'm, I'm i'm still uh without wi-fi here but it would be nice if we had one or two elected officials on some of our our calls. Um, so I would encourage us to reach out to them to join in some of these work groups. Thank you. Great ideas. Great ideas, everyone. I see that a lot of the strategies that you guys are just calling out right now, all of this uh, suggestions are actually like some of the uh, original strategies that we uh, came up with on our last working group. So now I want to actually invite all of you guys to take this survey that I just put on the chat. On the survey, I um, there's first a test question just to make sure that you guys are using the survey right. Um, the question is about who is going to go to the Super Bowl. If you guys can... Um, is the screen share working? Can you provide the link as well? We can't download Mentimeter here. One second. I'm trying to see why it's not working for me. One second, please. Okay. Um, one moment. I'm writing the link on the chat. menti.com. Code is 9786-9613. You guys can see the question, right? Great. So uh, this is just a test that you're, you're actually able to access and uh, join the poll. Um, but the question that I, I want to see as many of you can answer the poll. Um, Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Or you only care for the commercials? Are you team Bengals or are you team Rams? Um, I know that this is taking us off a little bit from the uh, conversation about strategies. But once we we get off the first question, uh, on the second question, we're going to rank on order of priorities. All of the strategies that we talked about on this conversation are actually um, are actually resonating with the initial strategies that we talked in the past. So um, you're gonna see oh, strategies that you just mentioned as well as strategies that were mentioned before. Um, I see only two responses. Um, anyone else wants to join in? Um, or are you guys having challenges? 
accessing the survey? Yes, I would say challenges. Yeah, it takes a little bit to, you got to write the number down and all of that. Last time, yesterday, you just hit on it, it took you straight to it. Yeah, I, it's the first time that I am using this app. Oh, okay, that's okay. I apologize if it's not as smooth as it was yesterday. Thanks that's for your okay, question. that's okay. Okay, I see four responses. We are a group of, uh, I think that we're a group of 10. So now I see six responses. That's great. We are at more than 50% participation rate. I'm, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so when you guys are ready, and I see that all of you guys only care about the commercials. So I'm team with you. Uh, but if you want, we can move to the next question where we start ranking our priorities and then we just keep the conversation going. How about that? So the priorities that came out from the, from the working group, from the past working group where we talked about strategies, um, the priorities were, um, of course, this is a wrong poll. This is about transportation and open space. Wow. I am very sorry about that. Let me share with you the right survey. We are about safety. Okay, I just sent you guys again the right link and I'm putting it on the chat, 7794-1724. I think we can skip the first question and go straight into the second, all right? So the priorities that came out from the working group were, um, how would you rank the following emotional and programmatic safety and security strategies? Uh, number one, provide free and low cost mental health services. Number two, improve participation in neighborhood watch programs, which is something that we've been mentioning, improving participation. Perhaps we are talking more about improving participation straight in collaboration with the police force and the sheriff's department. Uh, improve the escalation training for uh, the police force. Establish a coffee with a cop program. We're talking about building relationships, right? Um, promoting a program for for the police to live in the community, create designated safety zones or enhance community policing programs. Um, so please feel free to join the poll. Um, please uh, rank your choices in order of priority. And this is just gonna inform the conversation that we are actually having already. Uh, let's take two minutes um, to see all of you guys join and uh, participate. If you are having challenges sending your responses online, feel free to type them on the chat. And we are already having the conversation. So I just wanna encourage you guys to keep it coming. I am making notes and uh, this is what we're here for. Thank you. So let's just take a couple minutes for you, all of you guys to uh, evaluate your priorities here. And then we just keep the conversation going. Um, I have a question, Ms. Fikes. Do you know if the Coffee with a Cop program is no longer going on? Because I know that was something that we're doing in the past. I, don't, I mean, I'm assuming they'll resume it with, but so much has been sort of tabled with COVID. Oh, uh, okay. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the spring. We're going to take just one more minute.
All right, everybody. Thanks so much for your participation. It looks like the priority or uh, the um, strategy that took priority for most of you was enhanced community policing programs, followed by improving participation in neighborhood watch programs. And uh, number third priority is providing free and low cost mental health services. Um, so do you guys want to talk about uh, these priorities and uh, why did you choose them? Okay, something happened to mine. I didn't get to do the second question. Okay. Oh, we are not in the second question yet. Oh, we're not? Oh, okay. Well, that's not the question I answered. I picked the um, Enhanced Community Policing Program. Um, okay. That was my number one pick and again that's because um one we are you know whether we like to or not we are responsible for what happens in our community in our neighborhood and not to mention um uh, you're faster you know being there on the scene already than the police are so you're able to report it faster possibly even prevent or help sometimes so um i think enhancing community policing programs would help out a lot in the community, especially if um, we're hearing that the police are not out there at all. Um, I assume that, you know, this would be beneficial a lot. Thank you very much for your comment, Dominic. Anyone else voted for uh, community policing as their number one priority? Do you wanna share why? I put it as my number one priority also. Um, just basically because th there won't be any change in anything in anything relating to a community if the citizens themselves aren't a part of it you know policing in and of itself isn't going to solve anything so community policing is both law enforcement and the community working together and so many times that people who are in areas that resemble the, that Murchison Road corridor, people don't feel hopeful. People just sort of take it as status quo. If you begin to think that it can be better and you become invested in, then we see change on both ends because people will, people treat you differently when they see you're doing your part. It's just the fact of life. If you say like you don't care, then they ain't gonna care either on all ends. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your comment, Ms. Spikes. I am making notes of everything we're saying right now. How about improving participation in neighborhood watch programs? I think that that is also a straight relationship of like community policing. So we, we are talking about collaborations between the police force and existing residents. Um, anyone wants to talk about uh, why uh, you guys chose uh, improving participation in neighborhood watch programs as your second priority? I would, um, this is Jeanette. Um, Cynthia and I were just uh, discussing it as well. And as members of the neighborhood watch for the area that we reside in, um, it's very important you know, to be involved. So again, community policing on all aspects of everyone involved and everyone's boots on the ground. However, I think there's some not only improved participation, but along with that needs to be more education around what neighborhood watch programs actually do. It's not a watch and snitch program which I think that's part of the, you know, the negative connotation that is associated with being a part of such of a program. Um, it's about wanting to improve your community and keep keeping a watchful eye so that you can ensure that all parties that, whether they're guests, residents, what have you, are safe when they're in your community. But right now we have a, a small group of people trying to work for, uh, work in a very large area. And the majority of them are elderly. They don't come out. Um, I work from home. So sometimes I don't even leave my house after three days. <laughs> and that's just COVID. I mean, that's just how we were functioning now. So, you know, um, I have to make myself go to the grocery store. But um, it's like, you know, how do you get people more involved in, you know, wanting to be aware of what's going on around the community, but not 
not embracing the negative connotations that are associated with neighborhood watch programs or with community policing. Because a lot of folks don't want, I don't want the community the police in my community. Why not? <laughs> That's yeah. how you're ensuring safety. So yeah. um, coming from an area, Richmond, Virginia, where community policing was a really big deal. Um, my ex-husband was a police officer and he worked in a community crime prevention program. So I'm very familiar with it in that aspect. And I saw how it changed the community. We were in a a metropolitan area where we had crime, four housing com complexes, a lot of, of poverty, but the community policing was very effective in terms of, um, you know, getting people to pay attention to, and to report and all that great stuff. So I think this is going to be really important, the community policing part, and just excited about what can happen. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your comment, Jonat. Um, next up, uh, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, I, I just want to, um, Janet, that was a great um, response to as why you selected that. Um, I was a community policing officer in New York in the 80s. That's when it, when it first started to become implemented. Um, one thing I will say about community policing, um, that's something that FPD is already involved in with the PAL, the Police Athletic League. Uh, commu community policing really has to start from the with the babies um, to basically dispel the stigma that the police are an us against them type of organization. And when the children start to feel comfortable and they're playing with the police officer and they get to be friendly, you know, their perception of policing changes. Um, what I noticed with being a crime prevention specialist dealing with neighborhood watch programs is the people who came out to the neighborhood watch groups were usually um, elderly or middle-aged uh, participants, basically because the middle-aged people, they're protecting their property. They're going to work, you know, on a daily basis. So they want to make sure that their homes are safe and secure while they're away. And then, of course, the elderly's issue was they were just fearful. So a lot of the younger people I noticed, you know, in conversation and being out in the community, they don't have those fears. For example, I live with my mother now. I can come home from work or even in the middle of the day, three o'clock, and she's got the alarm on because she's afraid. Um, but I can sit in the house all day long and not have the alarm on because I don't have that same, you know, I don't identify that fear. So it may be a challenge, but um, that's where all of the community members get involved. Your program can be detailed according to your community. There is like no standard that says, you have to do X, Y, and Z. The police just ask that you allow them to come to present the calls for service and to get information, gather information, you know, as to what's going on and what's the concern so that they can work on that. But the rest of the community, you know, if your issue is um, elder safety or handicap safety, that's something that you take on that initiative to work through in that neighborhood watch. And maybe if you put that out there as uh, the focus, maybe more people would gather to it as opposed to it being a crime where we're telling the police everything. So we're working on all of the issues in the neighborhood collectively that would affect everybody, not just a specific demographic. Great Very great point. I like that. I, I do too. I like that. That's really good. Um, I just think that you have to dispel some of the myths and you, you're right. You know, yeah. the work yeah, starts at home. Right. Now I can identify with your mom about, you know, keeping herself safe during the day with the alarm and all that. Great. I'm the same way. <laughs> and um, it's not like I don't trust my community. It's, I, maybe it is, or maybe I'm just minimizing it, but it's just a safety, mm -hmm. you know, thing for me. But I, I want to get one of those ring <laughs> things so you can see what's going on on my block and let the police um, tap in because I have some issues. And uh, quite frankly, mm -hmm. I'm a little afraid to report. I reported one time and I was nicely told by one of the elderly folks on my street that what we do over here, what happens over here stays over here and we don't call the police. <laughs> and I was offended because <laughs> that's not how I function. If I see crime, I'm going to report. So this has been, um, and I was really taken aback by it because I was like, okay, this is the South. I was up north and it was the norm to call. And I was like, okay, why is it not the norm down here? And I had only been here maybe about four months. 
And I was like, so you're telling me I can't call the police and tell the police that the people on the end are dealing drugs and the girl down here. It was just so crazy. So I had to adapt to a, a, a community that was different in how I understood it should be. But, you know, I keep to myself, my children and I, I warn them about different things, you know, so you just have to be aware of how your community actually functions, but I want that to change. And so trying to work through it and uh, hopefully, you know, have some conversations with some folks that can help us. But right now I can understand with your mother, I'm gonna keep my stuff locked up <laughs> and I keep my lights on. <laughs> keep reporting, yes. Thanks so much for all your comments. We have a couple more questions. If that's okay, we can move on to the next, um, unless anyone has a, a closing remark about this um, first question. All right, so uh, next question. How would you rank the following safety and security strategies in terms of priority? Number one, improve street lighting, establish and expand a block watch program, create stronger connections to the sheriff's department, establish food, bike or horse patrols for more personal interaction, establish security camera systems that are able to be tapped into uh, from resident devices like ring, focus on improving vacant property or reuse or tear down vacant property and create a satellite police station within the neighborhood. Um, so go ahead, um, use the code at the top of, top of the screen to submit your answers or um, one moment. I am resending the link on the chat as well. Are you guys able to access it? Is it working for you guys? Yes, it's working for me. Awesome. Me too. Okay. So let's just give it one more minute to make sure that everyone uh, is able to submit their answers. Uh, if you have comments or a burning question, feel free to use the chat for that. And then we will open it up for, uh, for more conversation. All right, everybody. Uh, did was everyone able to submit your answers? So four priorities. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. So four priorities. Uh, it looks like the top priority is to create a satellite police station within the neighborhood. Um, this would be uh, the most important physical safety and security strategy. Um, Next up would be establishing and expand a block watch program and uh, shortly followed by establishing a food or bike or horse patrols for more personal interactions. Do you guys want to comment on uh, why you chose 
these items as your priority priority interventions? Well, you know, I think we beat that with that first one up about why we need that satellite police station <laughs> in the neighborhood, <laughs> and this, along with the, the block watch program, um, the improving the street lighting. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really important. Uh, Cynthia made a comment. She was like, you know, crime some sort of breeds in the darkness. But uh, y you know, I think it's uh, all of these are very important. Um, and I think the selections are sort of mimicking what we actually heard from the direct community on our community days when we went out and asked community residents what did they want to see as regards to you know safety and security. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. You're totally right. We've been talking about this all along, so there's there's no surprise on it being ranked as a top priority. Um, what about the uh, Blog Watch program? May I comment about the um, satellite neighborhood police station? Or should we move on? Oh, no, yeah, but please keep it coming. Um, I didn't choose that one as my priority because I don't know if anybody's on the call remembers, but when Fire Station 14 was uh, first built, the police department was in there. They were housed, we housed the um, traffic officers there. Um, one thing, that's very different about police and versus fire is police are called for their calls for service. So they're not sitting in a facility as much as people would think. The people who do sit in the facilities such as 467 Hay Street would be command staff and above and admin support and maybe the detectives, but even the detectives are out and about if they're not doing their paperwork. So I, I, I don't know what the goal is or is it a is it a thought is it a mental thing that you would feel safer because the the police are there um what what exactly is that knowing that knowing that the, um you know the police are not going to be sitting there they're going to be out and about which is ultimately why they left fire station 14 because it wasn't what the citizens initially thought it would be what, could I interject on that question right Certainly, now? sure. All right, yes, because um, that's a very good point because when I brought that up, I don't want it to be an empty building where communities just come there to complain about issues. My objective or my goal would be as a change of shift, a place where police come and go to change their shifts, an operating facility so that that presence is there for that community versus going downtown and going to wherever they're going to have that change of shift. My ultimate object, uh, my comment was about bringing more government related buildings to that area. So it brings awareness to the lesser of us of what's happening so that they can see it versus seeing it downtown where they got the nice restaurants and they've got the cleaner streets and things of that and their street lights are working. If that's not happening in the areas where the lesser of us live, then they need to be aware of that and change it. They don't need to be in a meeting to be told about it. They go to their office, they go to their, and they see it. They see the trash on the streets as they go to work so that they can make those changes. Um, so to just to clarify that point, we need to change our thinking in terms of policing all in itself. Um, when we talk about policing, um, I'm in the military, used to be in the military, we used to clean up, go police the yard, it means go clean up the yard. I don't want police forces to be cleaning up our streets. That's something we need to do ourselves. And I need the police education of how do we police ourselves? What are the right calls to make? Who should we get involved with those things versus calling the cops because your street lights are out? That's not really what the cops are supposed to be there for. But at the end of the day, hopefully we have the right people to educate our community so that we can police ourselves on issues that are hindering or hurting our community. That's all. <laughs> and I appreciate everything that you said, sir, and it makes perfect sense. Uh, but just so you know, your crime prevention specialists are available to basically help you walk through 
what it is that you should do or shouldn't do and who to call. All of that is discussed during community watch meetings, which I believe are being held on Zoom calls. I went to one last week, which, I, which was actually in person uh, in the corridor area, but they are there for Zoom calls. But um, that's a good um, comment that you made, the presence. And even, Johnette, I like what you said, talking about uh, your reporting to the station where you work. Thank you for the clarification. Thanks everybody for your comments. Uh, one thing that I don't see uh, on, on any of the charts and I don't see it on any of the uh, working uh, group board, uh, but we have been constantly talking about is education. We're talking about community education. Um, so um, I, I am gonna write it down because I feel, but, but please, if you guys want to expand on it, um, we are talking about um, educating the community on, how to uh, report crimes, when to report crimes, what Michelle was saying about this is a job that the um, community, community engagement uh, police, uh, what, I, I am sorry if I'm butchering your title, um, Najia. Uh, it's the crime prevention specialist that does that part. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. I really, really apologize because I didn't have everyone on screen. I just have you guys on the tiny little squares. So I can't read so much. Um, so uh, I, I am I am writing this education and perhaps uh, this would also be a, a, a strategy that could lead into like opening the communication between community and police or or um, resulting in, in additional ways to reduce crime. Right. Um, do you guys want to expand or um, do you guys want to keep talking about um, block, block watch programs? I do like what you said about education because I think I sort of pitched that a little bit too. So I'm not sure how we can add that in here or if it's sort of by default. Right. Sort of ex expected, but don't want to lose that, you know, because we can't, like, I think one, um, Maybe it was Mr. Fikes. She said, you just can't put it all on the police department. You have to, the community has a piece in it as well. And uh, we all have to own up to it. So educating not only the residents about what exists, how to, how to maneuver, but also how to, you know, use strategies in their own communities. So that's um, really important, that education piece. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Worrell raised his hand. Yes. Um... I think the question was asked earlier, how many police officers we have patrolling our area? I guess really the question is, how many crime preventionist officers do we have for that area? May I add one more thing? So how is a crime prevention officer different from a police officer? A crime prevention specialist isn't a sworn police officer. They're civilian employees um, and they, they do perform education, um, not just going to neighborhood watch meetings, but also let, let, let's say XYZ mm -hmm. is having an event and they may set up a table and just to be there to engage with citizens about different things. Um, the, my role as the community engagement coordinator didn't exist um, nine months ago. So it's a completely new role, um, but I don't have a sector of the city I work with the city, the, you know, the entire city. But one of the things that, that, that happens when we have a lot of different events and, and a, lot of, a lot of things aren't attended well because it's COVID. And then we do also offer Zoom for like our faith forums and several youth events that we've had. But then we hear, well, you know, not everyone has technology. So it's really one of those things where there's a lot of information out there in education on different ways, even things about young people and, and violence, which isn't something that we've really talked about here. But if you're looking at sustainability of a community, we have to figure out ways to also work with parents to work with our young people because the young people are committing more heinous crimes than at a rate that is very, very alarming. And that's one of those things that we have to educate community as a whole about because we're always protective about our babies, but we've had several different things there and attendance has been sort of sparse. Some of it we can chalk up to COVID, some of it is apathy. So I guess my, my thing would be, how do we 
craft a craft a message that is hitting all segments of the population that needs to have it? And how can we make sure that people are present? Because I'm a firm believer that we can't shove things down people's throat. People come to people come to the table and figuring out how to convince them to come to the table is a big piece. Absolutely. That's the million dollar question that municipalities across the country have. Well, um, well, Mr. Worrell? To answer your question. There are six. You asked about crime prevention specialists. There are six for the city. In the corridor, you have two. However, the corridor is split. Once you cross Country Club, that would be a different specialist. So there's one for the lower end and one for the north end. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, to answer your questions of how we can improve that, like I says, I have my mother-in-law who lives in Echoes Park. Now, one of the things my mother-in-law does do that most elderly and people still do today, they go to the mailbox. They go to the mailbox and they look at their mail. And if we can just kind of think back how we communicate back in the day, because to your point, everybody, I mean, it just took me a few months to get on Zoom. So I struggled with it. And elderly people don't do the technology. We understand that, but they do go to the mail. And if you go to the mail and ask simple survey questions, and you know, you do things with the little carrot and stick. You know, you fill this out, you get a coupon. You know, just little things like that we do in the business world just to get people to respond. You get an understanding. And being uh, you have from the police department, you have an understanding of what crime is going on in your area. Then you can focus your surveys on those type of things. So that then once you get your response back, then you can follow up with different type of programs, different type of initiatives. But that's what needs to happen to kind of navigate, not forcing people to do something, but working with them. But you first have to understand where they're at first. That's great. And I and this is where though the community would have to help because I can guarantee you, and this is just having done surveys, <laughs> you can send out 2000 and you might get back 35. And like, this is just because of like, this is like literally things that have been done even with some other nonprofits. So if something like that is to be embarked upon, it would also be encumbered upon people that are on the ground to make sure that there's follow-up. If let's say there's a mailer, um, when I worked in politics, if you did a mailer, that had to be followed up with boots on the ground. So that's one of those perfect partnerships where if there is some sort of mailer to, to do surveys or for education purposes, there has to be a commitment on the other end to make sure there's follow up to get a mail. It's just like sending out absentee ballots. You can send them out, but they still use a database to go back go back to those same neighborhoods to make sure that the next step is done. And so that's an excellent way that we can have a public community partnership to make sure that if we embark on something like that, we're back out there to make sure that we take it over the finish line. But that's excellent. It's an, and it's a great way for community members to get to know neighbors that they wouldn't, that they wouldn't talk to either. I have another um, follow-up question. Thank you so much, Najeri. Uh, and thanks so much, Mr. Wardell. Um, it, it's a follow-up question, really. Like, have, have you guys or have the residents talked about establishing like a neighborhood association or like a neighborhood committee? Um, when we were talking about the newsletters and having like this information um, shared among community members, um, we immediately went into talking to the newspapers and to the radio, but is there an actual like neighborhood association or neighborhood safety committee? Or have you guys heard about um, desire for starting a neighborhood safety committee, for example? Because I feel like like when people start talking among, among each other, that's when, when they start drawing relationships. Like, oh, the same thing happened to me. Oh, and, and, and that's when when like, people feel more empowered to address it. 
Well, I we think also it's important to note that it's different neighborhoods. Um, it's not just like one specific neighborhood. There are several different neighborhoods and that make up the, the actual area. And so they may not necessarily always see themselves working. Because I have a family that live in, in Eccles Park and, and other places, but they may not necessarily talk to people that live in certain er other areas, just being real. Like they, you know, your old retired school teachers and other things, and they may not talk to people that live in some of the other spots because there's a class difference. Even though when we're looking at this plan, we're looking at it as one big Murchison Road area, they're not necessarily neighborhoods where there was a lot of exchange, so to speak. Understood. Thanks for the clarification. Um, Okay, we are on time, guys. Um, I wanna be respectful of your time. We're having a fantastic conversation. I feel like we could keep going on and on and on and on. Anyone has closing remarks before before we go? I, I do, I, I'm sorry. This is this is my thing, security. I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely, go for it. So one of the, um, on the poll, it talked about um, blight, basically the vacant properties and uh, the big vacant buildings. Um, there is something called the broken windows theory, which is a theory that speaks to the, the, the demise of neighborhoods and how they come to be. And basically it says that when there's one broken window in the neighborhood and nobody does anything about it, another window will break and nobody will do anything about that. And it basically gives permission and I believe Ms. Johnette made a comment about the neighbor who said, we don't report things in this neighborhood. That is something that aids in that broken window theory and how the neighborhood would decline with regard to um, crime situations. So in order to turn that around, that's the message that has to get out there that Ms. Johnette, you keep reporting your, your crimes. You keep reporting your suspicious activity and you keep empowering people to do the same and speak it, what we hear and what we meditate on is what becomes our reality. So if, you're, if these people in the neighborhood are constantly thinking we don't do that, they're never going to do that without somebody else coming in and challenging that thought. And so in order to basically turn the neighborhood around, it starts you know, with small little steps, calling and, and explaining and encouraging why it's important to do something different because if you don't do something different, you're never going to get anything different. I hope that makes sense. It does. It does. Thank you for that. It does. Thank you. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. Cynthia. <laughs> She's absolutely right. I totally agree. And uh, I personally want to invite you to our neighborhood watch because um, what has happened uh, while Johnette and I weren't living here, of course, we're born and raised here, but we weren't here. Um, I'm thinking that, and I hate to say it, but our neighborhood watch has turned into more of a, a small social setting. And I don't think, and I've, I've, I've thought this from my first time attending, which was uh, three years ago, um, they're not taking advantage of um, the services in an effective way. Um, as I knocked on doors, and you're absolutely right, you have to follow up with people, you know? So you knock on the door, you have a conversation and uh, get their ideas and their thoughts, you write them down. And I have literally gone back to these people and they appreciate it. And you, I can't tell you how many people, um, you know, within walking distance of where the meeting is held, did not know anything about Neighborhood Watch in this mm -hmm. community. So um, it's very important for us to each one teach one, you know, mm -hmm. and you bring two, three, two or three people, you bring one person, but, uh, you know, you just have to break down those barriers and reestablish 
we have to, uh, Johnette and I have our work cut out for us and anyone who, uh, who wants to join, um, you know, you, you know, people don't know, they don't want to walk down the street with a flashlight trying to find uh, crime and stuff. That's not the purpose of the neighborhood watch. And uh, Mr. Thompson mentioned that on the last, on the last, uh, another work, work group that we had, you know, the, uh, you know, we have to redefine what our neighborhood watch is all about. Oh, we can have cupcakes, you know, in the lobby sometimes, so we can do, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, party with a purpose. I'm all about that. But um, bottom line is, you know, we have to get people out to get involved. Thank you very much for your comments, Cynthia. She's right. I have a quick question um, for Jeanette and Ms. Cynthia because I don't recall, but maybe you two can tell me. <clears throat> Do you guys get the crime report outs in your community watch group, or is that something that somebody else has kind of like forgotten to pick up? Well, we we just went through a period of not having an assigned um, person to our. Um, they had a vacancy, and, and Michelle reported in one of the other meetings that the person was being trained. And um, so hopefully we'll be able to engage really soon with that person and get back to getting those reports. Those were a standard. Um, yeah. From what I understand, yeah, this was prior to me becoming involved, that that was a standard that was happening on the um, meetings for the Seabrook Broadhill Crime Prevention Neighborhood Watch. So um, hopefully we'll get back to that once that person um, has been. Yeah, I, I can honestly say that the police department um, and the fire department and the elected officials, they do their part. You know, I, I must say that because, um, you know, three years ago when I started attending, uh, you know, there's a presence there. You know, they get up and read the reports. We get the reports. And like Jarnette said, you know, they, you know, the police department's been going through some changes. So, We've had one, we didn't have one. And I, and I think a lady, uh, a young lady has been assigned to us, but uh, you know, we haven't had her aboard yet. She, like she says, she's in training, but you know, it's not, uh, you know, that uh, the police department or the fire department, I can honestly say that. And uh, the few elected officials, uh, you know, they come out uh, during uh, election time. I'm sure they'll be uh, front and center in the next few months. But, uh, you know, they're there, and, but it goes back to uh, we, we need to use, the, you know, you know they're, they're, they're reporting, but to, to such a small group of people. And, um, you know, and, and the first thing I did was look around and said, wow, you know, we have all of these, uh, you know, people uh, with, with the resources and connections, but uh, nothing's being done on the community side. Mm. So, um, you know, we, we the, the, the watch has gone through, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of elderly people that have been there. They love it, you know, and, and, and they're, you know, they, they, they love what they're doing and, and we want to keep them aboard, but uh, we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, bring light to, uh, well, this is, you know, what we could be doing, uh, you know, in a gentle way so that we can pull in new members and, uh, you know, and, and keep it going. Uh, you know, keep it going. It, it's a great, great, you know, we're doing well, but I think uh, on the community side, we could do so much better. All right. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, we are 10 minutes over our time, so I want to be respectful of everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that it was a super, super productive meeting. Our next meeting is going to be, give me one second and I will tell you the date. I think it's going to be at the beginning of March. Yes, our next meeting is going to be March 9th at 9 a.m. So please save the date. We look forward to seeing you there. Um, same link. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna start getting to the nitty gritty of how do we make these uh, proposed strategies happening, okay? Um, feel free to reach out by email if uh, you guys have additional questions, if you guys wanna continue the conversation. Uh, I really wanna encourage you guys to uh, keep keep raising your voice, keep standing up. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys at our next meeting.
Thank you, Andrea. You did a great job, sweetie. Thank you, Andrea. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, everybody else. Mm -hmm. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.